Now for a very special keynote presentation. I would also remind people that we do have a virtual audience of approximately 100 accredited retail investors who are watching this presentation live. However, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Peter Moroni, Executive Chairman of Yamana Gold, which he founded in 2003. Peter has more than 35 years of mining, business, and capital markets experience and has sat on a number of public company boards. Prior to Yamana, Peter was the head of investment banking at a prestigious major Canadian investment bank. And before that, he practiced law in Toronto with a strong focus on corporate and securities law and international transactions. Thank you so much for your support, Peter, of the event. As you know, it means a great deal to me personally. Peter, the stage is yours. Thank you, Joanne. Good to see you. So good to see you. Thank you. Thank Where's you. the clicker, here? Ah, the clicker. That's great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And um, these lights are very bright. I can't see who's in the audience, but I do recognize some of you from outside in the lobby, and I do appreciate you making the time for uh, this presentation uh, today. With the illustrious introduction that Joanne gave, it's always difficult to sort of follow that up, but I'll do the best that I can. What I thought I would do today is I would speak to you a little bit on a topic that I'm sure is very near and dear to your hearts and to many others that are near to you. Uh, gold and what's happening with the gold price, but more importantly, from my perspective at least, what's happening with the gold equities. And I couldn't resist to add a little bit on the M&A side, and in particular, as a result of the fact that since Joanne introduced me to this uh, conference and said, would you participate and provide a keynote address, uh, we decided just for fun that we would engage in a business combination with one other company, and so I thought it would be useful to say, what are the things that you should be looking at in these business combinations? How do we apply those things uh, to this uh, particular transaction, and uh, what, happens, what happens next? I want to begin by saying that while this is a little bit about the price of gold, my interest is in trying to communicate to you that it really should be about the price of, share, of shares that manufacture the product. That, that explore for the product. It is not about the gold price only, it is about the equities, uh, those companies that are in this industry because they are undervalued and it represents an impressive uh, value proposition. I wanna begin also by saying um, that I guess when you've been around long enough to have seen several cycles, people think that you have something to say. I'm not an expert on gold, I am not an economist, but I don't think that this lends itself to economics and to economists. I think it lends itself to uh, experience and what's happened in prior cycles, maybe history that drives what happens next. In my view, the price of gold, and this is really the summary here before giving a presentation, the price of gold is well supported and investors should turn their focus on the added benefits of gold equities at this point, and in particular, this transaction, the two companies involved in this transaction, Yamana Gold, the company that I founded in 2003, and Goldfields in the context of this combination. Um, this, uh, there we go. So gold price performance, and what are the, the factors that go into that? Supply chain constraints, geopolitical uncertainty, and I'll speak to some of these in a, great, a bit more detail. The expansion of central bank balance sheets that has been occurring certainly over the course of the last decade, and a little bit before the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and certainly explosively um, since that time the elevated levels of government and broader debt, and then comparing that to GDP, uh, slowing global growth that seems to be just on the horizon at this point, and of course global inflation and the likelihood that we will be into an, a, a stagflationary environment going forward. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time going through e the, each of the items, but supply chain constraints are real. Uh, we see that not just in our business, but we see that around the world. You see that in your grocery stores. You see that when you're trying to buy any product that's out there. There's a, su a persistent supply chain bottlenecks, and there's the potential for a global food shortage that's on the horizon. Geopolitical uncertainty. We're in the middle of a kinetic war. We're in the middle of an economic war, and that is leading to further geopolitical and socioeconomic tensions. The expansion of central bank balance sheets, and I'll speak to this 
a little bit more in a moment, particularly as it relates to the Americans and the Fed. But this is unprecedented with a level of, of expansion of these balance sheets. We've not seen this before. And in my opinion, when these things occur, that's a perfect time to be invested in gold because gold does well in those environments. That elevated level of government debt and government debt to GDP, but it's more than just government debt. It's corporate debt, personal debt. And they've reached elevated levels to a point where there is a point of no return or just about at the point of no return. And that slowing global growth cannot be underestimated. That with the slowdown of global growth, the possible reduction of GDP, or certainly GDP growth, in the context of big balance sheets, big debt, and likely that debt increasing as interest rates go up, uh, portends very well for an investment in gold and gold equities. And global inflation, you know, we can uh, uh, argue whether or, not balance, uh, whether or not central banks and governments can tame inflation, but it will take time before that occurs. And I think that that point of being able to do that effectively has passed. And all of that then puts us in a very good position to look at gold as a way to hedge against some of those concerns about inflation. So let me drill down into a little bit more of these. A Fed balance sheet that has reached $9 trillion. Uh, when my now adult children were kids, we would sometimes play a very simple game of what follows a million is a billion. What follows a billion? Well, most people wouldn't have known 30 years ago that what follows a billion is a trillion. And here we are, we're talking about trillions as if uh, it's, it's, uh, it's old news. Nine trillion dollars of central bank uh, balance sheet is explosive. It is a multiple of what it was just a decade or a dozen years ago. And I think the more important part here is on the right-hand side, that government debt as a percentage of GDP, and in a time, as I was mentioning, where that government debt will continue to increase and the GDP is likely going to stay flat, possibly to down. Um, we, we see that with inflation as well and the global growth concerns. We're now definitely into an inflationary time with a risk that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, world economies will contract, certainly not grow to the level that they've been growing uh, in the past. Uh, so what does that mean then for gold? Well, in periods of economic uncertainty, gold is a natural hedge. It is a hard asset. It is a currency. Whatever nomenclature one uses, it is a store of value against the deflation of currencies and against the uncertainties that are geopolitical and socioeconomic. And those constraints, to summarize, are the expansion, the principal ones, expansion of central bank balance sheets, the elevated le levels of government debt to GDP, and global inflation concerns during these periods where it is likely that we're going to go through recessions that will contract global economies. And we've already started to see that growth in gold. It's impossible for me to tell you that gold is going up tomorrow. It's impossible for me to say that this is the time horizon that you should be looking at. But there's an expression in our markets that the trend is your friend. Let's look at that trend. This shows very elegantly, going back to 2003, 2004, once again, the time horizon of Yamana being public, and we've seen what's happened with gold price in that period of time. And we've seen even more recently what's been happening with gold price. So we seem to be in a slightly flattish period at this point where there's a consolidation taking place. But we recognize that those macroeconomic trends have not changed. And indeed, they're becoming exacerbated. And as a result of that, gold investors have been increasing their positions in gold. And that is likely to continue. But what happens next? And I don't want to be here to describe doom and gloom, but there is an element of uncertainty that points to some doom and gloom. And so we need to be sensitive to that and look at gold as that hedge or that insurance policy against some of that. And I pose it as questions. Has the US dollar been used to drive geopolitical objectives? I think the answer to that is check the box. The answer is yes. Has it been successful? But what are the risks? Again, we can say, check the box, that it has been somewhat successful, but those risks are important to, to, to identify. And in those risks, I would say that the weaponization of the US dollar forces countries that are not the United States, that are not fully aligned with the policies and objectives of the United States, to look to alternatives. And they are looking to those alternatives. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's not about geopolitical hostilities between one country and another. 
but you will look for alternatives. China is looking for those alternatives. Brazil, Iran, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia, any country that has looked at what is happening geopolitically, socioeconomically, I talked about a kinetic war between Ukraine and Russia, but now the weaponization of the dollar and then an economic war that is being waged against the Russians and their response to that, in my view, points to the fact that every other country in the world other than the United States and maybe the Western world will be looking at what are my alternatives if not the US dollar. And I think that gold is well positioned for that. Let's look at what happens in the context of some other geopolitical uncertainty. Uh, there's a significant part of the, of the world's breadbasket that is facing impacts uh, to production from the geopolitical conflicts that are occurring in Ukraine, between Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and Russia as examples. This will lead to food shortages. We're already beginning to see that in some parts of the world, but then it will come, become exacerbated and touch probably most parts of the world. And it will have, a, as I mentioned, a cascading effect. Fertilizer shortages, a big portion of the fertilizer that increases crop yields in agricultural settings all over the world comes from this part of the world. And so that will impact crop yields, not this year and next year, but into the next several years. Uh, and that will uh, exasperate the food issues that we're beginning to see. So gold is an alternative during these periods of geopolitical uncertainty and socioeconomic uncertainty. And the question that I'm often asked is, is gold performing as it should in the context of all of this, these messy situations that I've just described? And it's how, how should it perform and what happens next? Why is it at $1,840 per ounce? Why isn't it higher than that? And I would argue, once again, looking at history, that it is doing exactly what it should be doing. In a period where everything else is in steep decline, gold price will hold its own. And then as the dust begins to settle, gold price then will continue its upward trajectory. And we saw that interestingly in the prior cycles. And once again, the trend being our friend. If we go back to 2008, in that period, you might re recollect the gold price went from roughly $1,050 per ounce down to $740, $750 per ounce by the end of 2008, early 2009. And then it began its upward trajectory from there. Gold price will decline in periods of geopolitical, socioeconomic uncertainties. It could stay flat, slightly down, but it will do better than other asset classes and it just positions itself for what happens next. And we saw that in 2008 and I suggest to you that we're about to see it uh, again. But now let's talk a little bit about uh, the gold equities. As I said uh, several times before, gold is good, but the gold equities are better. And we really need to be focusing on that. We need to be focusing on the strong cash flows that are coming from the, gold, the producing gold companies, the returns to shareholders that have become imperatives of our company and companies that are our peers. The optionality, we can't overlook the optionality, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Gold shares trade based on optionality. What happens to gold price? That next discovery, if you're an exploration company, being able to take an asset that increases production and increases cash flows, if you're a producing company, in the context of a rising gold price, provides that optionality, and that leads to the multiplier effect. And in my opinion, that's been forgotten, and we can't forget it. We have to go back to basics. The multiplier effect is huge. That's what drives gold equities. Gold price goes up, but if your resources in the ground have increased from one level to a higher level, or your production has increased, then that multiplier effect is not just the gold price, but it's also the gold price multiplied by those extra ounces in the ground or those extra ounces of production or both. And we're in this unprecedented time where with all of this positive, perhaps because as was discussed in that, um, in, at the end of the presentation just before this, this address, perhaps as a result of assets under management in the resource sector being enfeebled, slight, well below where they were a decade or 12 years ago, we're not seeing investment coming into the space yet, but at some point that investment will come back because money has to find a home. And this is a, an industry that has an impressive valuation at this point. So strong free cash flow, dividends are being paid, and those dividends are increasing. And dividends, in my opinion, serve a further purpose. It's not just a return, but it's a bit of a compensation. 
If you're investing in gold, you don't have operational risk. If you're investing in a gold company, you have a bit more of an operational risk, and that operational risk is compensated in part by the payment of a dividend. That optionality, as I said, you're always one exploration hole away from a huge discovery, an asset that can go from 100,000 ounces to something more. Take our Jacobina mine. Jacobina was producing 78,000 ounces in 2014, and as of the middle of this year, with a second phase expansion of four phases, a very modest capital expansion, we will be taking that to 230,000 ounces this year, and then that increases to over 350,000 ounces in the next several years. We've taken mine life from about 10 years on proven and probable reserves to more than a couple of decades. So what happens to an asset like that? An asset that goes from a few hundred millions of value to almost a couple of billion dollars of value. That's the optionality to which I refer. There's always a potential for improvement of grade. And of course, the impact of gold price on all of that. And that multiplier effect, that with the additions of mineral reserves, low cost production, cash flow, increasing to enterprise value. It multiplies the increase in gold price by the increase in the number of ounces in the ground, the increases in the number of ounces of production, or both, that creates that multiplier effect. Gold price goes up by some percent. The gold equity should go up by substantially more than that, a multiple of that, and that's because of that multiplier effect. And coming to the value proposition, if we look at ourselves by comparison to many of the other sectors that are out there, even with the improvements that we've seen over the course of this last year, as you see in this bar graph, we've gone from uh, a, a, um, a price to cash flow of 6.9 times to 7.6 times, but that still doesn't compare to the into the teens multiples that are in some of the other sectors. And that's where I think the value proposition is that rubber hitting the road. So let's look at where we are then. If we look at the North American gold sector, the significant upside potential that exists, we have the 15 largest producers that have multiples that are nowhere near as some of the technology companies, and yet with that value proposition, with those cash flows that are at least as good on a per share basis as some of these other companies. And one of the other things that I think is interesting here is the size of the industry. If we take the 15 largest companies in our industry, they represent a fraction of any one of the large technology companies. It's a small sector. But because it is a small sector, when that rubber hits the road, when that value proposition is understood, when money has to find a home, when the dust is settled to this market correction that is taking place, it will be the corporate equivalent of a Niagara Falls volume of water of investment coming through a garden hose. And once again, history tells us that that is true. We've seen this before, and we will see it again. And in my view, we're just on that inflection point of that occurring. But to the extent that it's a small industry, it's also a fragmented industry. So what to do about that frag fragmentation, that fragmented industry? I believe and have believed in the 19-year history of this company that consolidation should occur. We've been a proponent of consolidation and put our money where our mouth is, where we've actually bought other companies uh, in the marketplace. Again, in the, in the presentation before this one, there was a reference to a company, Osisco, that existed up until 2014, and you might remember that we bought it. We launched these, the successful defense against Co Gold Corp's hostile takeover bid of uh, Osisco, and that's how we own the Canadian Malartic Mine. So I'm a big proponent of consolidation in our industry, and I believe that the best place for strong consolidation is with, I say here the intermediate producers, but I would argue that it's the producers more generally. Start there, and then see what happens after that. And these are some of the factors that should be taken into account. Companies must evaluate all of the possibilities. Can we buy something? Can we consolidate with a merger of equals? Or if we sell, who are the likely candidates that are the best candidates to manage the portfolio of assets that we have? Board of directors are obliged to maximize shareholder value. Market price does not, and you know this, does not always reflect in inherent or fair value and is imperative that a transaction must reflect inherent or fair value. I do not subscribe to the view that our industry is one in which there should be no premiums paid for corporate transactions. 
If the market is reflecting inherent or fair value, it is fair game to say, do an app market type transaction. And if it is not, then it is perfectly fair to say that a premium should be paid. We can't possibly be the only industry where premia are not paid. In every other industry, and some of you, certainly the Canadians here, are aware that one of the large technology, the large telco companies, just a few days ago, launched a takeover bid of a $3 billion company, and they paid an 80% premium. So I would argue that that is fair in all circumstances where the market is not reflecting inherent value. And if a premium is required to reflect inherent value, then as I say, the premium should be paid. But a premium is always embedded in the share exchange ratio. And even if there's a settle on the stock, it is embedded in that ratio because that's what companies agree to. Uh, and acquiring producing assets, another factor that I think is important at least, is always better than acquiring development stage assets. It's less risk. But if you're acquiring development stage assets, acquire something that has low capital intensity on a per pound of copper, per ounce of gold, and the like. And it takes time for companies to perform diligence, respect the diligence that they've done, and it takes time for companies to properly communicate that diligence that is undertaken. And while I'm respectful of cost synergies, in the roughly three and a half decades that I've been involved in business combinations as a lawyer, as an investment banker, and as a corporate executive, it is very rare to see whatever people represent as cost synergies actually occurring. And my view is that the better synergies to look at are operational synergies, optimizations, and where you can improve one operation as a result of a business combination between one company and another. So let's come then to the transaction between Yamana and Goldfields. It's an all-share deal with an exchange ratio of 0.6. Goldfield shareholders and Yamana shareholders will share then in the company to a rate of 61% to 39%. Without the premium that we're being paid, it would have been 29% to 71%. So we are properly reflecting then on the 61 39, we're properly reflecting the, the contribution of both companies to the, the net asset value of the combined company. Shareholder meetings will be convened in the third quarter. Following completion of the transaction, the Goldfield shares will be uh, continue to trade on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and their ADRs will continue to trade on the New York Stock Exchange, and we are giving consideration to a listing on the Toronto Stock Exchange as well. After all, the four largest companies in our industry trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's only fair to say that's an exchange that should be considered. The deal follows more than seven months of diligence, and in the con it is in the context of other deals, and a considerable exploration and operational efficiencies will come as a result of this transaction. A little bit on the two companies. Goldfields been, has been in around, around since 1887. It is South African based, but it has assets in Chile, in Ghana, Peru, and South Africa. It, is a re, it, re, it regionally represents itself. So it's in three regions as a result of this transaction. There is a fourth or fifth region between North America and South America. It's all in sustaining costs are $1,160 per ounce, and it will produce within the next couple of years with a mine that is coming into production, 2.7, just under 2.8 million ounces. And it pays a dividend and has been paying a dividend for some time. Yaman is Canadian-based. We have assets in Canada and in South America, four countries. I'll get to that in a moment. We were founded in 2003. I took it public in 2003. We have strong open pit and underground experience. We produce just over a million ounces gold equivalent between silver and gold. And we do all of that at an all-in sustaining cost of $1,080 per ounce. Both companies will have their costs reduced as a result of new mines and optimizations. I mentioned Jacobina. They have an asset called Solares Norte that's just about to come into production. These mines are lower than our average in terms of costs. And so we'll be bringing our overall average down, we'll be bringing our margins up, free cash flow will increase, and there's that multiplier effect again, if you believe my view that gold price is going to higher levels. So we're an America's focused company, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, with five mines in production, producing gold and silver, a split of about 89%, 88% to 12% between gold and silver, 
We have a copper gold asset in Argentina called Mara. Mara is a brownfield project. The plant already exists, and we're just taking that through feasibility study and, and permitting. It represents an interesting project, certainly to a larger company, because the production platform of that asset is 550 million pounds of copper per year, and we own 56 and a quarter percent. We have growth in our company. We take our production platform this year of a million ounces to a million and 60 within the next year, 18 months, and then ultimately over the course of the next four years, our production platform increases to a full 1.5 million ounces with the prospect of that becoming more. Our cost construct will be coming down as a result of those new ounces coming in at lower costs from lower cost mines and operations. We generate one of the best free cash flow yields. We measure that based on cash flow and on revenue. So take your free cash flow and divide that by the revenue, divide that by operating cash flow. How do we compare to peers? It's a measure that says, are you more efficient than your peers? And we are amongst the best, if not the best of the peers. And we have one of the longer reserve lives in the industry. As a result of this transaction then, we will have assets in Australia coming from gold fields, Africa, South America, and North America with a combined portfolio of 14 mines in four districts, uh, as you see shown here. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the further uh, aspects of the company that we create. The business combination delivers an entry into a very elite club of the largest gold producers in the world. Within the course of the next couple of years, with a mine, as I mentioned, that is just about to come into production, the production platform of this combined company will be just under 4 million ounces. And that compares very favorably to Barrick, Newmont, and Agnico. We now have entry into an elite club of the largest producers in our industry. But that doesn't drive what this is all about. That just gets you entry into that elite club. The balance sheet is important. So more than a billion dollars in the treasury of the company. Cumulatively, our liquidity is $3.8 billion. We have a long track record of paying dividends and increasing our dividends over the course of the last several years. We alone, since 2019, have increased our dividend a full 500%. We're leading in free cash flow and operating cash flow conversion, and there's more. So now that we're in that elite club with a strong balance sheet, how do we compare on the other things that are really important and critical to investors? Well, we're leading in terms of free cash flow conversion and free cash flow yield. So again, that conversion being, how do we compare to our revenue? How do we compare to <coughs> our operating cash flow? We're leading in terms of reserve life index. Take our proven and probable reserves. What does that demonstrate in terms of mine life? And compare it to Barrick, Newmont, and Agnico. And we compare impressively favorably. But then the rubber hits the road, using that expression again, when we look at the value proposition. Price to net asset value, price to cash flow, and underpriced value to EBITDA. The three measures that are normally used in our industry. And if we look at those three measures, the combination still creates a company that has significant upside. If we look at all of these measures as shown here. We are the gold bar and the others are uh, the other three companies that are in that elite club. And we have more growth than those other companies. We're better positioned to deliver growth and that growth comes with low capital and high, and high return uh, projects. That growth then takes us from that roughly 3.8 million ounces that I referred to a moment ago. And with the growth that then comes from Yamana, they have short term growth, we have intermediate and longer term growth. It's two pieces of a puzzle fitting together. We bring that production platform to a significantly higher level. And we're very comfortable saying to you that this is a 4 million ounce per year producer, just under 4 million ounces. But there's every reason to believe that that production will be in excess of that and as much as 5 million ounces per year. We will be in excess of Agnico. We will rival Barrick and likely overtake them in terms of size and scale. And all of that production comes from low cost operations, means, meaning that we have significant value upside. In the few moments that I have left and in the slides here, I'm talking about the operational synergies. So just to give you an example, we have an asset in Brazil, Jacobina, that is modeled on what, we, what exists in Africa, in Ghana, with their Tarqua asset. It's the same conglomerate reef construct. Their experience can be brought to bear 
to look at how can we take that phased expansion and maybe bring it forward by a little bit. And there are many other examples of that. You see that, however, in that map that is at the bottom right. This is before the Continental Divide. And if I looked at it, I would say that there's a line that one draws directly between their Tarqua asset, what it, their South African asset, and Jacobina. And that's what I mean by operational synergies. Can a management of a combined company better exploit the assets that are in that company as a result of the experiences of one to the other and bringing that to bear on the totality? I know I'm running out of time, but I want to end this presentation with a case study on an important one. Goldfields has been around since 1887. They have, in South Africa, the deepest underground shaft mine in the world. We have the Canadian Malartic mine in Quebec. Canadian Malartic will transition from an open pit to an underground. It will be a deep shaft underground mine. We have experience at dealing with these mines in Canada, and we as a company have that experience. Our partner, we're a 50-50 joint venture in that asset, has that experience. But we can't deny that the company out there that likely has the best experience and for the longest is Goldfields as a result of that uh, experience that they have in South Africa and how does that parlay into what we have uh, in Canadian Malartic. What you see in the upper right here is the growth in resources over the last roughly five, six years. We've gone from just about 1.4 million ounces to over 15.5 million ounces in that period of time. And presently the mine plan calls for a conservative just over 7 million ounces being mined. We know that number will likely increase. And so the way that we looked at it was how do we accelerate that increase? I'm confident saying to you that there is significant opportunity here that supports Canadian Malartic being amongst the largest, likely within the five largest precious metals mines in the world. And that will be demonstrated over the course of the next several years. So a new major gold company with a portfolio of assets across rules-based mining-friendly jurisdictions, financial strength and focus on shareholder returns, uh, leading in the quality uh, issues and attractive valuation. We have a robust platform to deliver organic uh, growth, and we have a vision to be the preferred gold miner delivering sustainable superior value. It takes two exceptional companies and makes it an even better one. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation for this morning. Do you have time for questions? Questions from the audience for Peter? Uh, look, I, I, I apologize that I ran long, but I no, always no. enjoy questions. And uh, Terry when you need him? can someone Terry. put me on the spot and ask me a really good question? There's Terry. Peter, thanks. Just, just a quick question, two quick questions actually. One, are there any exogenous factors left, uh, except the shoulder votes, I guess, that actually can, can derail this deal? And two is that, do you actually talk about the dividend policy of the merger company? Yes, so uh, the answer is no. There are no um, exogenous factors. We do have to go through normal approvals, uh, everything from Canadian investment uh, uh, approval to other jurisdictions. Uh, but this is not the sort of transaction that will limit competition or the like, and so it's unlikely that there is any issue there. We're already beginning to get some of those approvals coming in. Shareholder vote will be required. Likely that will occur in September for both companies. Um, the indicator suggests to us that that vote will be favorable. Based on what we're creating here, it should be very clear that shareholders will see, will see the benefit of that. And, and I would go to one more factor that I think is important, maybe history being our friend again. Uh, I'm looking back maybe 30 years, and those of you in the audience maybe have more experience than that, but in the last three decades, I can only think of one transaction where it has gone to a shareholder vote and the, and the shareholders have not voted in favor of it, and that was as a result of exogenous factors. And I believe it was the Iron Gold and Wheaton River transaction in 2004 where it was two other companies that came in to try to bust up that deal, and so there were many other factors that caused a lot of noise uh, in the minds and hearts and votes of shareholders. Dividend policy. Uh, we don't have a policy, we have a philosophy. The philosophy is to take our free cash flow and increase that dividend. Uh, we are looking to establish a policy. Our partner in this deal does have a policy. It is a, a coded approach to dividends, 25% to 35% of earnings. 
Uh, they're paying roughly at the 30, 25% level. And this transaction, interestingly, actually creates more comfort and free cash flow for longer to be able to say that it can go to the higher level and for longer. So, so I have a simple question for you. Uh, you were talking about some companies deserve a premium. I've never, ever met a CEO who thought his stock was fairly valued. And so the question is, why don't you think the market properly values companies? I didn't say that the market doesn't properly value companies, and that's a fair comment. Uh, but what I would say is the market does not always fairly value companies. And we're into a very unique time in the market, aren't we? And again, in that presentation just before mine, I caught the back end of it, but the person speaking said, we have to look at assets under management. They have shrunk significantly in our industry. There, has been, there have been other factors that have been interesting to investors, uh, cryptocurrencies, technology. And so the mining sector has not fallen into disarray, but the investment side of the mining uh, sector uh, is more disheveled than it has been in the time that I've been observing it. And so I would say it's understandable then, given the number of companies in the industry, given the number of issues that are taking place, and then all of that activity that is taking place outside of our sector, it's understandable that not every investor can pay attention to every detail that would support a company's inherent or fair value being reflected in the share price. And I don't know that I agree with you that chief executives don't always come to the conclusion that the market is properly reflecting their fair value. Uh, last year, it completed early this year, we had a business combination between Agnico and Kirkland Lake, and both companies came to the conclusion that their share price was reflecting fair value, and they did an at market type transaction. So I would argue that that's certainly indicative that their chief executive said the, the share price is properly reflecting infer, inherent value. But I would go one step further. And I'm not saying this to be controversial, but I'm saying it to say, let's make sure that we understand uh, what's really taking place. If we look at the disclosure that those two companies made in their information circular, it's very detailed disclosure of the history of that transaction. A year before, apparently, they were very close to just at the point of doing a deal. And that year before, the Agnico share price was at a certain point. A year later, the Agnico share price was at a lower point. The Kirkland Lake share price was at a low point the year before, and a year later, it was at a higher point, roughly having gone up about 35%. So a year later, they did a net market transaction that they were prepared to do, or came very close to doing, the year before. So I would say to you, how is that not a premium? Because there is a premium, although it's embedded in the share price. The market reflected inherent value, and it, that premium that would, would have been required the year before. So to say it differently, they could have done the, the deal the year before, just paying a 35% premium. So that chief executive came to the conclusion, I presume, that the market was not reflecting fair value and waited until that occurred. But it's just as conceivable then to say, well, then pay the premium and get the deal done and then move on to demonstrate the quality of the acquisition and the things you're going to do with those assets. Very good. Thank you. Peter. Thank you. Thank you.